Hello everybody, Lore Master of Sotek here, and there's a couple things that I think we should talk about today. Um, there's obviously a lot of things I want to do and talk about, but today the main focus is actually going to be on a plethora of information that has come out recently from the developers of Total War Warhammer Creative Assembly over on Reddit and on Twitch. So if you've been living under a rock, and perhaps I'm the only person you follow, despite being a fan of Total War or what have you, uh, you may have missed out on this, but most of you have probably seen various videos from Turin or Indie Pride or whoever covering the announcements that were, not announcements, but the discussion that was had over on the official Twitch channel. And I'm also going to be expanding onto that from a recent AMA that was done by Creative Assembly because there were a couple of really interesting things that were brought up and a lot of people have been asking for my thoughts and my opinion on what was said so that's what this video is going to be it's not necessarily like a news video it's more uh you can think of it more as a response video that being said down in the description i will have a link to both the twitch video and the reddit thread that way if you want to double check anything that i'm talking about or you just want to see it for yourself, yada yada, then you can go check that out. So, I've got a list here. It's not in any... Uh, I start with... I'm going to start with the AMA, and then I'm going to work my way down, and eventually we'll get to talking about what was talked about over the on the Twitch page. And some of these things were kind of obvious, but I'll cover them anyway. And I'm not going to cover every single thing that was talked about. I'm only going to cover the things that I found particularly interesting or noteworthy. So the first is that over on Reddit in the AMA, there was a question asking, does CA have a overall plan for how many DLCs are left? How many Lord Packs are left, I believe was the actual wording. And Creative Assembly basically said, yes, the goal right now is that there's going to be two more DLCs for Warhammer 2 and then we'll officially be going towards Warhammer 3. But of course this may change due to the pandemic with COVID-19 uh, as you know anything could happen at this point. That being said I would be really surprised if they changed their schedule. The only thing I could see them changing is like pushing back the release dates maybe. I don't see them actually changing their plans. To me that doesn't really make sense just because their situation I could see it being slowed down, but it's not like they're going to be hurting financially or anything like that because they're a video game company. You know, they don't need us to go out and fill in seats or be doing all that stuff. If anything, people are going to be buying and playing video games more now than they normally do because you have to stay home and video games are a good thing to do during that. So, that being said, we know officially that there are two Lord Packs unless something horrible happens. So, we're just going to assume there are two Lord Packs left. And we can say with a fair amount of certainty that the next one coming up is going to be Greenskins versus High Elves. That seems like, if it's not Eltharian versus Grom, that would be staggeringly surprising. It, it, it just doesn't really seem like there's any way we come out of this situation without having Grom and Eltharian next. Just because the Greenskins are probably the most desperately in need of an update of the four, because they're the only one of the starting factions from Warhammer 1 that have not been updated yet. And of course, even in the AMA thread, there were a number of Greenskin-esque comments made by Creative Assembly. Someone even asked, you know, who they thought was the most in need of an update. They were just like, oh, Greenskins. And then during the Twitch stream, somebody asked about Grimgore and they were like, Oh, you know, really soon Grimgore's getting an update. You know, really soon Grimgore's not going to be bad anymore. So it seems pretty set in stone that we're heading towards Greenskins versus High Elves, which is, of course, super exciting. Um, as for who the second, the last DLC will be before we go into Warhammer 2, I don't know. That's kind of a toss-up. I feel like it's almost certainly not going to be dwarves or vampire counts because I feel if they were going to do either of those, they would have done them during their free LC updates. But for whatever reason, they thought that we, we either wouldn't want it or I don't know. But so with those two out of the way, the only factions that leaves who are in need of a DLC would be Wood Elves, Beastmen, Norska, Warriors of Chaos, 
And that's really it. Because they've already updated Proton... Yeah, those are the only factions that have not received any kind of update or DLC. So, that being said, we haven't seen them do a flat DLC for DLC yet. So, we don't know if that's even an option. You know, it could be that the Last Lord pack is some whack group or character or set of characters from who knows. You know, it could be... It could They could come out and be like, hey, look, more... Uh, Lizardmen versus High Elves, or Dark Elves versus Lizardmen, or something. Like, I don't know. It could be literally anything at this point. So I, d I have no idea who the last one might be, but um, I feel very, very confident that we're heavily looking at High Elves versus Greenskins for probably a May release. The next thing that they talked about that I found interesting, although sad, was somebody basically asked, is there ever been a character that y'all at CA have wanted to do, but weren't able to for whatever reason? And Rich, who is, Rich is basically the head of the uh, design team or the DLC team at least. I don't know if it's DLC precisely or just overall design, but I've met Rich a number of times. I love Rich, he's a great guy, he's a giant. But, uh, Rich is a really, really cool guy, and his response was basically that a character they really, really wanted to do was Prince Apophis, who, if you don't know, is the Scarab Prince of Nehekara, which he is a really scary assassin-focused fo character, but the problem with him is that he's made exclusively out of a swarm of scarabs, with, like... He's basically an animated swarm that wears some vague armor and looks like a floating, or like a giant Tomb King that's like just running around killing people. And they basically just talked about that they really want to have him in the game, but currently with the tools that they have available, his animation would be super difficult. Which makes sense because he's literally a swarm of bugs. You know, this is a character who would never stop moving. And would be really, really complicated to animate. Much less, like, just to have him stationary. Much less moving around, attacking people, interacting with troops and stuff. And, you know, having an attack where he, like, vomits out uh, scarabs, which he does in tabletop. So, you know, there's a chance we could see him someday if, you know, Warhammer 3 comes out. And, you know, the game sells extremely well and all the DLCs are just making tons of money and stuff. Maybe they could fit in. Uh, really hard to design character like that or maybe if they had a breakthrough with how they're utilizing the engine in Warhammer 3 who knows but it does seem likely that we can officially put Prince Apophis on the probably not going to happen list which is a shame he is a super duper cool character that I would love to see the next thing uh, is, <laughs> is almost kind of more of a complaint but it does merit note which is that in the AMA they basically, uh, I believe it was Rich, commented that they are looking to continue expanding Ikit Claw's workshop with adding more Clan Skyrire creations to it, which I think the one that everyone was clamoring for is the Warp Lightning Cannons, you know, the big siege weapons, which does make sense. But I have to say, especially if you haven't watched my problem in the Warlock video, you should go watch it. Because if there's one thing I gotta say, it's that I am getting sick and tired of that Ikki Claw campaign getting more and more and more and more overpowered while all of the Lizardman campaigns just remain to be complete garbage. And there was even a lot of conversation about that. There was an entire question thread of people asking about the balance of DLCs and how if you compare the Hunter and the Beast... Well, if you look at the last three DLCs, there's been a lot of not balance between the factions. You know, Ten and Juan and Nakai were both vastly inferior to their counterparts, and Malice was pretty inferior to Snitch. You know, and they CA kind of responded with the idea that, oh, well, you know, if you look at Ten and Juan, it's not that he has less features, it's that his campaign is harder, so it seems that way, but... You know, and some people in there basically called bullshit on that, and I call bullshit on that. Not not in a mean way, but, you know, if you go watch my video, one of the things I talk about is that it's not that Ten of Wands campaign is because it's hard that it's worse, because that doesn't matter, you know. I would I would say that most people would argue that, for instance, Belagar's campaign is harder than Skarsnik's, but Belagar, I think, tends to be considered a better campaign because there are more features 
that are unique and interesting. You know, you deal with Tin Juan and Ikat Claw, and it's not that Tin Juan is harder that makes it worse. It's that Tin Juan doesn't have anything exciting or interesting going on, even if it was super duper difficult to justify his campaign being as boring as it is. You know, both of them, and the biggest example of that is that both of them have a unique workshop setting, you know, with the sacrificial pyramid for Ten and Juan and the uh, clan workshop for Ick Claw that give them unique units. But for the Lizardmen, they just get the basic ass regiments of renown that you paid for in the DLC, and you have to go through this super obnoxious upgrade system and waste sacrifices to get units you should get normally. While Ikit Claw gets completely unique units um, from that system and gets his regiments of renown the normal way, which is just blatant favoritism to, or not favoritism exactly, but it just clearly shows that one side of that DLC got finished before the other side, and you can't deny that. And I I don't understand why they even bother trying to deny it. It's it's just so obvious to see that the, you know when you're dealing with the Ten of Wand versus Ikit Claw or Nakai versus Wolfheart, it became... I don't think it's as bad with Malice. I think Malice is more of a situation where they didn't really know what to do with him while keeping the campaign focus mainly on him as a character. But when you're dealing with at least Nakai and Tinuwan, to me, it's painfully obvious that they just didn't... They either didn't have enough time to finish the Lizardman aspects of the DLC, or they just... I, that's the only thing I can think of because I can't say that oh they weren't imaginative enough because bullshit like the they are literally in a DLC with a friendly or with an enemy faction that has a bunch of cool stuff that they could have had something equal to and CA has clearly flexed their creative muscles recently because all the last few DLCs have been really amazing it's just that they're only amazing for one of the two factions in it and I, people are noticing and it's starting to become a theme which is concerning so I, i'm glad to see that ca is at least aware of it but i do hope that the community continues to apply pressure to help ca understand no it's not it's not that ten and Juan or nakai or malice are too hard that's not the problem the problem is that they don't have good features or their features that they do have are really lacking and just they're very basic and not interesting. You know, it's not that I'm not able to win by barely trying. It's that there's nothing really interesting bringing this campaign to make it stand apart from the others other than stuff that makes them inherently frustrating to play. But hopefully that's something we'll see them work on in the future. The next thing that came up was they have... Rich has basically given us confirmation that we're going to see Boris Toddbringer's playable. And maybe he'll come with a Cult of Ulrich faction or a Middenheim, a Middenland faction. Uh, just because somebody asked, you know, when are we going to see Boris? When are we going to see Boris? When are we going to see Boris? And basically, and the same thing basically happened with the Red Duke on the Twitch stream. Where people were like, hey, when are we going to see Musion? When are we going to see Musion? And Rich, to both of those, just said, try and be patient, guys. You know, just just be patient. Which, to me, is, seems like a pretty solid, you'll get it, but you'll get it when it's ready, and we just, you know, it's not ready yet. You know, we don't have time to work on that right now. There's other stuff that's more important. So, that's what I would say to everyone who's excited for those things, is that it sounds like they're pretty much confirmed, and that at some point, they will be playable campaigns, playable factions, that will be, you know, fully developed with, uh, and will be awesome and fun. But we have to wait, and they're they're almost assuredly going to be free LC because those things are already in the game. It's just we have to wait until they can set aside the time and the money to get it done, alongside whatever else else it is they're working on. But that's you know that's great news. Another thing that came up during the Reddit AMA that I, I was personally very very interested in was people asking about are we going to see the map expanded. And they're specifically focusing on Lustria, Nagaroth, and the Southlands. Because I would say that probably the biggest, one of the biggest concerns about the Mortal Empires map is that the map is got starting to get kind of crowded. And what makes it frustrating is that there is a lot of space that's not being utilized because the map's theater or the playable area of the map just 
very harshly cuts off despite it not being the end of a, of a continent. And, you know, it's one thing to shrink a continent down a little bit, kind of like they did with Ulthuan, where they just flat out reduced the number of provinces but kept the whole thing in so there's still ocean and interplay and stuff like that, to what they did with the, the other three continents, which is they just flat out nerfed them or reduced their space quite a bit. So, and I agreed with basically what the poster said, which is, you know, every, I think everybody agrees that when this... Uh, this topic used to be brought up everyone would just say oh no the intern times man it, it's too long it takes it t it takes forever to go through intern times it's just it can't be done it can't be done it can't be done and then the potion of speed update came out and all of a sudden everyone's like holy shit this is like a billion times faster and now everyone's like okay now we want that space in because clearly the game can handle it you know, clearly now that y'all have optimized the ability for the AI to make all its decisions and move and for the end times to function, it would, it does not seem like that big of a deal to add on the parts of the map that's missing and move everything around a little bit. Because it probably would not add in that many new factions. It would just give a lot more space. Because Lustria in particular is so, well, Lustria and Nagaroth in particular are horribly squished. And you have a ton of characters who start off sharing the same province, which is just a nightmare. Um, and it's something that could be very, very easily fixed by just expanding them all the way westward and southwards. So that, you know, you're hitting the ocean on both sides. You know, that would give so much more breathing room. And you wouldn't, you'd have to maybe add in five to six new AI factions just to give them like a starting opponent. But I, I really hope that's something that they end up going forward with. They, they, they didn't really give a committal answer to it. They kind of seemed like, oh, you know, that's kind of something we're looking into. But there wasn't a definite yes or no answer. But I, I, I do really, really hope that they push that. You know, the only, the only thing they really said was that it was easier for them to push the map east into the Darklands just because that part of the map was always there. It just wasn't being used for anything because it was ripped from Warhammer 1, um, which I always found super strange. You figure if they were going to have extra space on the map, they would have used the space that they used in Warhammer 2. Uh, but clearly they took the Warhammer, Warhammer 1 map and expanded that to fit Warhammer 2 instead of using the Warhammer 2 map and adding the Warhammer 1 map onto it. Uh, but hopefully that's something that they can address before the before we hit Warhammer 3. Or maybe that's something they won't touch until Warhammer 3, in which case, I, I don't know, we'll have to see what happens. But um, that's, you know, that particular subject. Another thing that came up that there was actually a lot of conversation about this, which I found very, very interesting, which was that the Proving Grounds beta has basically wrapped up um, to my understanding, I'm not even sure if it's still running at this moment from, from the way, because just because I've been focusing on some other games lately, but it seems like from the way most people are talking, it's either ended or it's about to end. And CA, CA has not given any comments or official thoughts on what were the biggest takeaways or things they learned or feedback or anything like that. They basically just said, thanks everyone for participating and we did learn a lot of really fascinating, interesting stuff. But the thing that I found interesting and want to draw attention to is that it does seem likely, if we're lucky, that this may be a thing that CA does going forward. You know, try and introduce really dramatic changes to the game and put it out as a public beta that everybody gets to try so they can just get tons and tons and tons of feedback on Reddit and the forums and Twitter and what have you and be able to have a lot of that information to work with, which I think is a really good, awesome way to look at those things because it, it was a massive change. And there were some things about it that were positive, some things about it that were negative. I know for me personally, I think the biggest takes away, takeaways were that I, I enjoyed that there was a slower pace of the campaign because it made it more in my opinion it made it more impactful getting to the late game because it took longer to get to the late game and i also really enjoyed the uh the elimination of army supplies i think army supplies is a terrible stupid mechanic that does not do anything like all it does is punish the player for having more than one army 
So if you want to run elite troops, you just have to run a single doom stack and nothing else, and it can make the game really annoying. And that that's a feature that could just go die in the ditch, and I would never miss it ever, ever, ever. And I know like Bretonia as a unique racial feature doesn't suffer from supply lines, but hopefully they could just turn that into something else, like give them an active buff instead. But I um yeah, I, but there were some things that weren't great about it. You know, there were clearly some economical issues, but uh, that, that would probably be better as its own separate video. But hopefully, it seems that they've collected a lot of really good data, and it's, it'll be very interesting to see what they keep going forwards, and hopefully they'll put out like a nice big blog post where they talk about that. The next thing uh, kind of rolls into what I was talking for earlier, where people were not complaining, but drawing concern to the DLC campaigns like Malice Darkblade and such. And one of the big things that I think stuck out that I really probably need to make another completely separate video on, but want to touch on, was that a lot of people are really starting to push really hard for the concept of moving capitals. Which, frankly, seems like it should just be a base feature in the game. Like, if you're playing Total War Warhammer and you're taking over lots of territory something and you just decide hey i want to move my capital to a different settlement either because it's in the center of my empire or it offer uh, you know it offers me better trade opportunities or maybe it's the lore capital or i want it on the front lines or whatever it, it really feels like that's something that should either be completely controlled by the player like should just flat out be a button where you're like i move my capital here period end of story or they simply need to add in a system where if a if a faction does not start at their lore capital so to speak then when they take it it immediately shifts for instance if you're playing belagar and or scarsnake or quick head taker if you take over Karagate peaks it should immediately become your capital or if you're playing vlad von karstein or isabella and you take over castle drakenhof it becomes your capital or, you know, same thing for Malice Darkblade. Hag Grave should be your capital once you take it. For Tretch Craven Tail, Crookback Mountain should be your capital once you take it. For Teclis, it should be Safari. Uh, for, you know, the Tower of Hoeth. For Wolfheart, Marcus Wolfheart and Balthazar Geld, it should be Altdorf if you take it. Becomes your capital. You know, that, that really feels like something that should be a base feature. In that, if your character is typically associated with a particular city or their faction at least as that city is like you know all if they were the first character to be put in the game you'd say okay it's a no-brainer this character would go here then that should just become their capital once they take it over i i really strongly feel like that is a no-brainer and that and there are plenty of mods that do it but really that's that's something ca needs to add into the base game there's no reason for that not to be in the base game after that uh some other big things that they talked about that i found interesting and wanted to draw attention to uh, a couple of quickies here from the reddit ama was that one ca is very aware of the fact that the order factions are kind of curb stomping most of the other uh factions right now because you Based on the post, they've kind of taken, it seems like, the Age of Sigmar philosophy on allegiances as opposed to the Warhammer Fantasy one. Because in Warhammer Fantasy, you had the forces of order and the forces of destruction. That was it. And then there were, you know, Tomb Kings and Ogres were neutral. But that was it. Like, all of the undead, the greenskins, chaos, all of that was one super faction, which was destruction. Uh, but they had, which it worked, but it also kind of didn't work at the same time. It seems that they've taken the much more logical stretch now of looking at from more of a um, Age of Sigmar perspective, where now it's broken up into order, chaos, death, or undead, and destruction. Which in that, pretty much the only neutral army you would actually have would just be the Tomb Kings. Because at that point, you basically have all the order factions would stay the same, then your undead would just be the Vampire Counts and the Vampire Coast, but not really the Tomb Kings and Archon the Black, I guess. But not like the regular Tomb Kings. Those guys typically would stay neutral in that scenario. Then you have Chaos, who are all the Chaos factions, Skaven, Norska, um, all those guys, Warriors, Beastmen. 
And then you have Destruction, which Destruction, of course, is your Green Skins and your Ogre Kingdoms when they come along. But of course, Green Skins, you have, you know, all your Orcs and Goblins, stuff like that. So, um, that being said, it seems like they're trying to find a way to balance the game between those four groups, which is going to be pretty difficult. And, you know, I'll be the first to say that right now Order definitely has a significant advantage. And I think that's because they tend to have a lot better centralized locations. There tends to be a lot more of them at the start of the campaign. And they are more likely to confederate and form, like, notable empires. And it's difficult for the AI to invade them without just getting completely repelled. You know, whether it's Ulthuan or the Empire or Bretonia or Athel Lorin or... Lustria or whatever. So hopefully that's something they continue to work on. I know in my personal opinion, the death factions are probably suffering the hardest with the, it, to me at least, it feels like the vampire, it feels like the vampire coast is actually pretty close to being in a good place where they're active and alive for a lot of the campaign and they can be a thorn in the side of a lot of people and Luther Harkin tends to take over a lot of territory. But Solostra, Deerfawn, and then the, all of the Vampire Count factions are just a joke. Like, they just get curb stomped. And they never confederate. Even if they're just in a really terrible scenario. So that's definitely going to have to be addressed. Uh, two other small things were basically that I saw were... One is that a lot of people were asking about Raponce de Leoness's banner. Because her, her character is most famous for her banner, arguably. And that she traditionally would carry... A big old standard in one hand with her big old the Fleur de Lee banner, and then she'd carry a one-handed sword. But obviously in Total War Warhammer, they changed her to stand out a little more from all the other characters, so she carries a two-handed sword and doesn't have any sort of banner whatsoever. And a lot of people asked about that, and basically they just said that they didn't feel comfortable um, adding the time and resources that it would take to give her a banner because putting all that effort in just for a single banner that would like only be used for that even though I, I do feel like the modding community would vehemently disagree with that but I, I do hope in the future they will hopefully hit a point where they look into her having it, it would be so great to see Rapunz just you know, it wouldn't even have to be, like, her holding it. Maybe, like, she, uh, maybe there's, like, a pole coming out of the part of the saddle that has it. Or it's strapped to her back or something. I don't know. But it would be really, really cool to see that get on her model one day. You know, we had to beg for Albrecht's trident for, like, two years. So maybe it'll be the same for Rapunzel's banner. And then the last thing was uh, something somebody brought up that I thought was super duper interesting. Was... A lot of people, myself included, really enjoy the Empire Dilemma system where you basically get asked to be an ally in a siege. So, you know, one of your potential allies is being attacked. You get a dilemma where you can spend some money to send a very small army and you basically go fight the equivalent of a skirmish battle. You know, it tends to be a smaller green skin or chaos themed army and you're fighting with maybe 10 you know five to ten units with a character alongside a small ai army and you you know you fight this really desperate battle and something they kind of talked about is that i thought was super cool and would really like to think more about in the future was the idea of making smaller and just different kinds of battles so instead of your campaign just being you know you start off with smaller armies at first and you have more like skirmish battles but then by turn 20, you know, you're having medium to full size battles. And then for the rest of the campaign, it's just like 20 plus stacks, you know, 20 stacks plus a garrison or multiple armies. So you're running multiple 20 stacks and, you know, allowing there to be a system where either through dilemmas or special circumstances, you get involved in fights that actually require you to take smaller armies. So for instance, you know, you'd fight a situation where maybe you only get five units in a character or maybe you're only able to take... Imagine imagine if there was a scenario where you had to play a map where you were, like, only allowed to have a team of characters. Wouldn't that be cool? Like, you just had a brief hero hammer. You know, you get a dilemma where it's like, oh, there's this beastman cave that has this horrible gorble in it, but it's, you know, it's deep in the forest and it's surrounded by enemies, so we have to send a small band to deal with it. So for that mission, you can maybe send some characters you have... Like, maybe some generals and some heroes, or maybe you just get a small band and try and have to win. Maybe you get, like, a bunch of money and a really cool magic item out of it. 
or something like that. I, I think that would actually be a really cool feature to add in that could shake up the gameplay and give you something different than just constant mass battles. You know, it's like, oh, you have a scenario here where you have to fight a small regular battle, but it's you and an AI team and you're both capped at 10, 10 units per team and you're deployed weird and the deploy and the terrain's kind of whack and then you've like a big enemy army or maybe imagine if they had like a last stand scenario where it's like okay you have to do this scenario where you can take in an army and you have to fight unlimited enemy troops like as soon as you kill them they immediately respawn a new unit of a similar size or maybe they get stronger and stronger but you have to survive for 20 minutes or 10 minutes and if you survive, then reinforcements will arrive and you win the battle. And if you do that, you get something really cool and stuff like that. But like introducing new battle modes to just shake up the campaign from, especially late game, from just being monotonous 20 stack versus 20 stack just over and over and over and over again. And I thought that was a really, really cool idea that I'd really love to see develop, especially going into Warhammer 3. Another thing, a uh, very, very small thing they talked about where a lot of people were asking about if they're considering bringing in confederation mechanics for the Vampire Coast and the Tomb Kings. Because if you haven't played as those factions, you might not know that you cannot confederate with either of them. Basically because they're pseudo-neutralish or crazy or very arrogant uh, races so that they basically will not bow down to each other under any circumstances. So if you're playing as Luther Harkin, there's nothing you can do to get control of Solostra, um, Noctilus, or RNS Assault Spite. Or if you're playing as Kotep, there's nothing you can do to get, you know, Setra, Archon the Black, or Kalita. Um, which is a bummer, because there are scenarios in the lore where, you know, you those guys would force each other to bow down or would uh, be able to break one another to their heal or power. And they're, they're saying that they're basically trying to find a solution to that that does not involve outright confederation. Um, and it, it seemed like kind of what they were looking to for inspiration was a system like there's a really, really popular mod out there where if you kill a faction that has a character of your race, so like say you're playing Lizardman and Itza gets wiped out, but you never got Gorok before they got wiped out, that maybe there would be like a system designed so that you could get Gorok. You know, how cool would it be if, uh, you know, you're fighting as Noctilus and you wipe out RNS Assault Spites faction of Sartosa and maybe you could get like a quest battle that if you, you know, she makes a last stand and if you beat her, then she bows down to you and you get her at whatever level she was, but all of her skills have been, you know, deactivated. So you have all her skill points so you can build her how, she, how you want. I think that would be a really, really cool thing. Um, to introduce so that players could a always get characters even if they miss confederating with their faction just because the confederation mechanics a little unreliable for almost all the factions and b you know allow factions like the tomb kings and vampire coast to still acquire all the legendary lords which for a lot of people is a really really important thing in their campaigns outside of that the last things are pretty much all on twitch so during the Twitch stream, which I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched bits and pieces of it and I read a Reddit thread that had all the highlights. And the biggest highlights that stuck out to me were first and foremost, that they have basically, oh, this was also in the Reddit. I think this was actually in the Reddit thread. Sorry, this was the last thing in the Reddit thread. But basically it seemed the goal, one of the big goals of Warhammer 2 was to A, have a change or update to every single playable faction in Warhammer 2 and 1. So basically by the time that we're done, 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 done with Warhammer 2 and moving on to Warhammer 3, the goal is to make it so that there is just nothing nothing left to do uh, for those. And, you know, there's still stuff to left to do for those guys, but everybody's at least gotten something. You know, everybody's received a piece of a pie to carry them into Warhammer 3 where we move towards finish completing the trilogy. Um, and included in that of course it seems that one of the big thing or two of the biggest things that they're, they're wanting to address and change are the Wood Elves being a, a particular the Wood Elf Amber mechanic which I would say is hands down the worst mechanic in the entirety of Total War uh, Warhammer. It is, it is by and far the worst feature and out of any of the races, out of any of the campaigns, it's just absolute garbage. 
because all it does is punish the player. You know, it's a situation where they came up with an idea and they ran way too far with it, and clearly not enough feedback was given um, before that somehow got out. But, um, so there's that, and then the Chaos Invasion system, which is essentially the end game. You know, right now it's basically, you have big Chaos Armies come out of the very top right of the map, and then some big Chaos Armies and Norskan Armies spawn in the North and South Oceans, like right smack in the middle of Mortal Empires, and that's it. Um, and you know, there's like a little Beastman army, and it's super lacking and has not been updated since like Warhammer 2 came out. Um, and it's it's a really distastefully boring system that's very underdeveloped, not exciting, predictable, and easy to manage. No matter how weak or strong your your empire is, quite frankly. So it's good to hear that a those features are very very much on their mind, and b hopefully we'll see those updated maybe before the end of the year. Uh, the last thing to I saw on the Reddit... Yes, so this is the last big thing I saw on the Reddit thread that I'm actually super excited about um, being a thing was somebody basically... Which, this hadn't even occurred to me um, until I saw somebody ask it in the Reddit thread. But somebody asked, okay, what would... Basically, have y'all thought... CA, have y'all thought about... So before the current, if you haven't played uh, early Warhammer 2, there used to be a completely different dilemma system for digging through ruins. Or maybe it was Warhammer 1? I don't remember exactly when it was. But it used to be that whenever you would search a set of ruins, it would basically put you in like a roleplay scenario. It was a dilemma instead of a puzzle. So the puzzles that we have now, the puzzles of the old ones, are very literally just flat out easy to, not easy to solve, but necessarily. But they're just flat out puzzles that are like, hey, here's a Sudoku puzzle, or here's a matching puzzle, or whatever. Pick the right answer and you're good. It used to be that they were basically role play scenarios with four, with a situation that with like four outcomes. And you would pick which one you thought was the best one given your situation. And it, you, it could come with any myriad of things. It proved to be exceptionally unpopular at the time because they designed it so that A, it was, it was very weird how they designed it because you very rarely had an idea of what the correct answer was because there, there was no right answer. You could literally get the same dilemma more than once in a row and pick the same answer and different things could happen which was really frustrating for some people. But the biggest thing was that it would actively punish you, which people hated. So you'd go into a ruin because you wanted to find some money or a magic item or something, and instead you'd pick the wrong answer and you get like, one of your characters would be wounded for four turns, so you just couldn't use them. Or a character would get like a, a massive debuff on their army for a massive, oh, it was way too long period of time. So it was like way, 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 way too punishing. You know, it was it was a situation where you're you were like, I I sh want there to be, I want there to be, you know, worst case scenario, I just don't get anything, or maybe I get something but it comes with a cost. Not you flat out just get punished because then I just don't want to do it at all. And uh, someone asked, you know, it'd be great if we could bring those back in addition to the puzzles. So when you're searching through ruins. You know, it would be a 50-50 chance. Maybe you'd get a puzzle of the old ones, or maybe you'd get a dilemma. Um, I, I would say that, A, I really like that idea, because it, it is a little silly that every single settlement in the world has an old one puzzle under it. That does not make a lot of sense. But, B, it would really shake up searching through those, because you genuinely would never know what you're going to get. And it would be harder to go on autopilot when searching ruins. Because, let's face it, the puzzles, once you figured out how to solve them... You've either, you've either gotten to the point that you can just solve them instantly or you got to the point that you can't and you got frustrated and you downloaded a mod so then you could solve them instantly. So it would be nice to see those dilemmas come back, but their results, the way they functioned and how they penalized you would definitely have to be revised. Uh, the last two things that I'm going to be talking about today are that uh, a very, very simple one. This is something that I have been saying for a very long time as a very strong belief of mine, but it was outright confirmed during the Twitch stream, was that stop asking for Thankwill. Thankwill is coming, but he Thankwill will... There's no 
chance Thankwell will be in the game till Warhammer 3. Thankwell, uh, the mighty Gracier that I think a ton of people are very, very excited to play, has been 100% confirmed as a Game 3 DLC or free LC character. He is not under any circumstances going to be in Warhammer 2. And personally, I'm still very much hoping and believing that this is because Game 3 is going to be about the end times. So we're going to get end times Thankful and Bone Ripper, not regular Thankful and Bone Ripper. Because regular Bone Ripper sucks. <laughs> like, he's... Yeah, I guess he's an automaton, which is a little okay, cool. But end times Thankful is just a thousand times better looking. And having Bone Ripper as a mount is like six billion times cooler than just having him as like a stupid robot that wanders around Thankful but turns off if it gets too far away. You know, I, I don't need another Scar Snake and Gobla. I want something, I want that whole huge hulking rat ogre with four arms that two of them are like big braziers of flame and two of them are giant flamethrowers. You know, that's just way more awesome. So hopefully that's why he's not coming out until game three. But I think uh, I can speak for many people when I say can't wait to see him, and I'm more than happy to be patient so we get the best version. And the last thing they talked about, which I am the most excited about of everything I read, was that CA has officially confirmed that they are looking... Vaguely confirmed, but confirmed enough that I can say confirmed. That they are looking into and working on adding more Warhammer terrain into the game. So when I say that, what I mean is one of the things that's really bad about Total War, uh, Warhammer at least, is that the terrain is super mundane and boring. You have forests, you have rivers or water features, so like rivers and swamps that are shallow, but anything, any deep bodies of water, any buildings, any, and like none of that exists. You know, you have walls if you're defending a settlement, you have forests and you have shallow bodies of water that's it and it's so boring and not at all what warhammer is about you know th those things exist in warhammer sure but warhammer is all about magical terrain and crazy terrain you know magical forests that have profound effects or units that can swim through deep water like imagine how much cooler it would be to play on one of those choke point maps if you had aquatic units and they could actually move through the deep water or if you were playing on a map with like a lake or the ocean next to it or something and units that had aquatic could actually swim through the water so that they could attack a flank that your opponent can't you know your opponent can't charge them because they're in too deep of water like that would add in so many cool unique mechanics to those ground units to kind of give them their own version of fly in a sense where they're essentially untargetable except for by shooting um but they also talked about like having you know, buildings that have arcane effects and magical forests and exotic forms of terrain that would have more unique forms in the battlefield. But, you know, obviously they're dealing with some really weird differences there because A, they've never done that before. And so programming their AI to understand how that terrain works and how to utilize it. So, you know, if it's terrain that's bad for you to be next to or, you know, you want to avoid it, teaching the AI, okay, stay away from this but then teaching them, okay, but this terrain you want to be close to. You know, maybe it's a temple that gives you a leadership buff, or maybe it's a forest that, uh, you know, causes you to suffer from damage if you're standing in it, or maybe it's a, a, you know, a set of fungus that give you poison attacks if you're fighting in it, or maybe it's, you know, uh, water, or maybe it's like a lava thing that causes damage over time if you're standing on it or whatever. So, um, obviously they have a really long way to go from that, it sounds like, and it absolutely sounds like we won't see it till Warhammer 3, but th that does roll in significantly with them talking about one of the big things that, of course, you may have seen on Turin and everybody else's videos, which is that they have 100% confirmed that the siege system is going to be reworked for Warhammer 3, which is amazing. And that was easily my number one request for Warhammer 3. Like, if I had to pick a single feature for Warhammer 3 to focus on, like a base level feature of the game, you know, not including like races and all that stuff, um, like new models and stuff, but it would be that they would completely rework the Siege system. Because the, the Siege system we have now is just very boring and straightforward and uninspired. You know, it's, it's very small, you barely have any room to maneuver, 
Uh, you can't put things on the walls that you sh you know you can't put war machines on the walls. You can't put large shooting units like deck deck gunners or um, Gisales or any of those like large weapons that would completely make sense on walls up there. You know, it, it it's just really badly done. Just it it, it was very. I don't want to say it was rushed, but it felt like the sieges were the very last thing to be developed. And if you go back and look at, you know, the Warhammer 1 videos that were showing off the sieges, they were complete horse shit compared to what we actually got. Like, clearly, they either did not start the sieges until much later in the development process, or they, you know, just really scaled it back after they revealed it. Because almost all of the trailers show off um something happening siege wise that cannot happen in the actual game you know you watch the green skin trailer the vampire count trailer or the dwarf trailer you know the dwarf trailer you're seeing like crazy war machine you're seeing cannons and guns and stuff on the walls you can't do that in the vampire count trailer you're seeing them fight like over multiple tiers of the city across bridges and stuff you can't do that and then in the green skin trailer, you see them assaulting the walls, and it's just like a thousand times more dynamic and interesting than it actually is in the game. So clearly there's a lot of false promises in those videos. But um, really, really excited to learn that they're going to be manhandling that and hopefully redesigning it. Not, n well, probably, yeah, from the ground up. Yeah, it, it would be so much, well, you know, I'll make a separate video on it. I'll make a separate video on it. But that's going to be it for the news um, coming out of Creative Assembly. Uh, hopefully this provides you all something, some really, really interesting things to think about and talk about, uh, during your time in isolation as you hopefully are and behaving yourselves while staying safe. So, uh, this video is already a uh, 6 billion times longer than I wanted it to be. I was like, uh, maybe 20 minutes and here we are at almost 50. So let me know what I would really like to know from you guys. Which features are you the most, ex which reveals or hints or updates are you the most excited about? Is there anything that they haven't talked about that you really want them to talk about? Is there anything that disappointed you? Um, and for the chain, for the systems that they are talking about updating, whether it's the Wood Elf Amber system or the Siege system, or adding in more like smaller types of battles or gameplay, what would you guys really want and like to see come to fruition in Warhammer 3 and stuff like that? i uh, really love to read and uh, uh, see your thoughts down below. So uh, thanks again so much for watching, guys. I'll catch you next time. Stay safe out there. Wash your hands. And I'll catch y'all later.